Now, as we were going to air today, we learned that a major court decision has come down, to the surprise of everyone in North Dakota, um, because it's a Sunday night of this three-day weekend um, of Columbus Day, or other people celebrate as Indigenous Peoples Day. A three-judge appeals court decision has come down in Washington, D.C., denying an injunction being sought by the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North Dakota as they attempt to stop a $3.8 billion pipeline from being built from the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota through South Dakota, uh, through Iowa and then Illinois. Thousands of indigenous people from South America, Central America, the United States and Canada have gathered at encampments to try to stop this pipeline. We're joined in studio by Jossie Ross, who's an author, speaker, lawyer, storyteller, member of the Blackfeet Nation, author of How to Say I Love You in Indian. His recent article for Indian Country Today Media Network is Native Americans Need Hillary to Actually Be an Ally Against the Dakota Access Pipeline. So this is breaking news, Jossie, that we all just learned, because the decision just came down. Talk about the significance of this and where these presidential candidates stand. Thank you very much, Amy, for having me. The the decision itself on a Sunday, specifically the Sunday before Indigenous Peoples Day slash Columbus Day, is kind of a surprise. But really, it shouldn't be a surprise. The antipathy with with these um, courts, United States courts, treat Native communities, and specifically treat Native communities as opposed to um, capitalistic ventures. Um, this is big money, as you mentioned. And, and, you know, there's, um, unfortunately, on the good side, it won't affect the organization that's happening out there on the front lines in Standing Rock in Cannonball, North Dakota, where those natives, those thousands of natives that you mentioned are out there, whether day or night, cold, rainy, dry, it doesn't matter. They're committed to the cause and aren't reliant upon a federal court for validation of this movement that they need to save this water, not just for the benefit of our communities, even though that's very important, but, in fact, for the benefit of millions and millions of people, both Native, non-Native alike. And so they're doing that irrespective of what the federal court says. Regarding this particular debate, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, as the professor mentioned, that these revelations came across, because hopefully it'll teach all men, including myself, including a lot of other men, to up our level of understanding and, and willingness to engage and entertain distasteful comments. That's something that is, I think, a referendum on all men, you know, and, and I, I think that's very important. However, there is the part where I fear, as the professor mentioned, that most of the, the energy at this debate is going to be committed to these particular comments mm -hmm. and the piggishness and disgustingness of these particular comments and this attitude and not towards substantive um, areas. So, for example, in regards to the Dakota Access Pipeline, well, the Democratic Party at the Democratic Convention said this would be the most progressive um, platform in regards to climate change that this nation has ever seen. However, there's been no substantive follow-up to what that means in regards to how are we going to actualize this. Well, one way we can actualize it by is by stopping this Dakota Access Pipeline. The fact is that this pipeline cannot commence without any federal approval. And so if there's no federal action or, alternatively, if a federal agent, um, uh, you know, kills this deal, then the, 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 the pipeline doesn't continue to go forward. And so if, um, if Hillary Clinton, candidate Hillary Clinton, truly wanted to live up to what she says, that this will indeed be the most progressive platform in regards to climate change, and we want to do something affirmatively outside of just cap-and-trade deals, this is a good starting position for that. What questions do you think ought to be asked tonight of the candidates on climate change, on tribal treaties? Well, this—thank you very much for that question. And it's—those are two separate questions. Um, Donald Trump, unfortunately, showed his cards very early, like 23 years ago, of how he felt about treaty rights, when he talked about how um, Native communities should not be able to engage in, in economic development activities because he didn't want the competition. And so he doesn't in, see... In terms of building casinos. That's right. And so he doesn't see tribal governments as legitimate governments that should be able to challenge and develop our own institutions. Hillary Clinton, as the, as the, um, as the um, column mentioned, 
says she's an ally. She has wonderful Native advisors. And those wonderful Native advisors have said that this is likewise going to be the most progressive platform in regards to their treatment and understanding of that government-to-government um, -government <laughs> relationship, that these are, in fact, relationships that are, that are sealed with treaties that you only do with governments that you enter into as equals. However, not the, the lack of willingness to even enter into those conversations, whether it be re, in regards to Dakota Access Pipeline, to what do treaty um, obligations mean, that's kind of troubling that those waters have not been ventured into at all. So if I were to pose a question, I would say, well, what does a treaty relationship and a trust relationship mean to you, Hillary Clinton, somebody who's supposed to be an ally to Native communities? Speaking of climate change, it's believed more than 900, and the number could well exceed 1,000 Haitians have died yes. as a result of Hurricane Matthew. Um, the horror of what climate change looks like, the toll it takes.